right, let's uh, get this thing started. Hello everyone, I hope you're well. Um, welcome to Math 391. I have uh, some people getting in right now. Um, yeah, so strange way to meet you for the first time, but uh, this is me, I guess you just uh, see a head on top of some shoulders. Um, but we are going to be uh, kicking things off right now. So hopefully everyone's settled. Still have a few people missing, but we'll just jump into it and get started. Um, so let me uh, share my screen with you. Okay, good, let's go. So <laughs> love the enthusiasm coming from Jason. Okay, let's, uh, let's actually jump into it. So this is Math 391, so hopefully if you're here, that's the class that you uh, mean to be in. Uh, and it's methods of differential equations. So normally, um, students who would take this class would be those in, engin in the engineering program, various engineering programs. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone except computer science is probably required for, but it's also probably required for computer science. Um, people in the sciences would be, it, it would be good for students if you're in the sciences as well, uh, especially physics. And it's good for math majors to take also, even though technically it's not a required course for a math major, but not knowing about differential equations would be a mistake if you're a math major. So hopefully you are in one of those groups or maybe you're just taking it for fun, I don't know. Um, but we are here to learn differential equations. Uh, so we are meeting three days per week, as you can see here, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I think there's someone else coming in. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from 1.20 to 3 p.m. And it will always be the same link. So the link that you use to join today's class, you always use that, uh, that link to join the class. Um, you just have to register for each instance because I need some way to track attendance, especially when I need to submit the roster to CUNY first. Okay, that being said, let's actually just jump into it. Not too much planned for today. For the most part, I just want to introduce you guys to the class, how things are going to happen. Um, the rules still have some people trickling in here. Uh, the rules for the class, we're gonna go through the syllabus, talk a little bit about what this class is about, what we will be doing, and then we will uh, hit the ground running tomorrow um, with uh, the syllabus officially. So, uh, to introduce myself, my name is Javon Smith. I'll be your instructor for this course. You can call me Javon, it's fine. And here, what you're seeing here, this is actually a copy of the syllabus that I posted into OneNote. Um, I will be posting the recording of this video that you're currently watching, as well as a PDF version of the notes that you, will, you are seeing on the screen uh, after every session. So uh, you should be taking notes. But if you miss anything, don't worry too much. It's more important that you kind of listen to me and pay attention. Uh, you will be able to go back and review anything you have to. Um, so this is just a copy of the syllabus and I'll probably show you the, the website where you can get this uh, pretty soon. Um, but we're gonna go through this, we're gonna talk about the class, how it's gonna be run, and uh, a little bit about the subject matter before moving on. I think some people are also having internet issues. I see the same person trying to log in multiple times. Anyway, also, just to uh, reduce uh, the number of glitches that can happen, I normally turn my video off while giving the lecture. So um, from now on, you will just be listening to my soothing voice while uh, reading or, or just seeing what I'm doing. Anyway, okay, let's jump into it. So as I said, my name is Javon. Um, this is my email. That is the email that I like my students to use. It's not my city college email um, because there are a whole bunch of issues with that that I'd, I'd rather not be contacted by my students through that email. So if you're my student, this is the email that you should be using. Office hours for this semester. There are no official office hours, but of course I'll be available to meet by appointment, usually a little bit before or after class. This is my main website. Uh, so I maintain course pages for all the classes I teach uh, going back to 2012 
though I started a little bit before that, you can find them here. And this is the class website for this particular current class. Okay. Um, this is the syllabus. It's a, a PDF document on this website right here. And all these links that are in blue here are actually clickable once you go to that website. Uh, the class text is elementary differential equations and boundary value problems, um, the 10th edition. You do not have to buy a physical copy of the tests, but um, if you can have access to the text somehow, that would be good. Um, this is the math department website as well as the 391 website. Yeah, the 11th edition is fine. Um, you won't really need the textbook. Like I'll, I'll tell you every, I'll give you all the notes you need. I'll get, tell you everything you need to know and the sections, uh, I will introduce them as well. So the textbook, why I would say it would be good to have it is basically for extra practice. So if you want to practice a, a bunch of problems, if you want to work on something and the homework is not enough, and, and usually the homework is the bare minimum that you should be doing. Usually you do want to be practicing more problems than is just in the homework, but uh, the textbook will be useful for that. So uh, even if you have the ninth edition, the 10th edition, um, the 11th edition, it doesn't matter. Uh, I do, later on, I give some, I believe a list of problems. These problems though are from the 10th edition. So that's why the 10th edition is in my syllabus because these problems are related to the 10th edition. Um, okay, so yeah, so that is da, da, everything there, okay. Um, by the way, you should be able to find the math department website online. Uh, you can Google CCNY math and the website should come up and then you can go to people. In fact, maybe I should, maybe I should show you guys that knowing where the website is, is actually, uh, important. Okay. So this is the website. Now, if you, if you haven't gone there, you can do CCNY math. If you Google CCNY math, you'll see something like this going into any page is fine. So you can click here. Um, and if you go to people and you scroll down to the bottom, because my last name is Smith. So it's all the way at the bottom. You can click that and it brings you to my main page. It'll bring you to this page right here. So here you'll see a list of all the pa course pages. Now, at some point later, I will be referring you to, I believe this course right here, um, but we'll, we'll get to that later. So I, I, I maintain pages for all my courses. Now you guys will be here. So you go to the CCNY math website, click on people, click on my name, uh, under summer 2020 classes, you'll see 391 right here and you can click on that. Now I will be updating this page. Sometimes it loads very slowly. I, I'm not sure why, but um, okay. So for now, I will be updating this page as time goes on, but there's already a lot of stuff there. Uh, of immediate attention should be things like the syllabus. So the syllabus that I will be going through is posted on the website. You can click here to access the syllabus and then all links will be clickable within this document. This is the course learning outcomes, um, things you're expected to know by the end of this course. And here is a link to where I will post the videos for these lectures. So if you go here, it'll send you to the playlist. The playlist is currently empty, but I will populate them as time goes on. If I need uh, quiz test reviews are already posted. Uh, we'll talk about tests and finals uh, and, and finals pretty soon, as well as the announcements are of immediate attention, I guess. So test one, as you know, see here is June 25th. Test two is on July 16th and the final is on July 23rd. So those are some important dates, but this is the class website, very important resource. I will be referring you to this uh, throughout the semester. Um, but that's where you can actually find the syllabus. So um, going back to OneNote. 
So I pretty much copied the uh, syllabus into the OneNote documents. So these are just pictures, but I'm going to go through it with you, make sure we all understand the rules. And if you guys have any questions, you can bring them up and we will deal with them. Um, so as you guys are aware, hopefully, uh, things are really crazy right now. They've been really crazy for a while. Uh, 2020 has been a roller coaster so far. So a lot of things are in flux. There might be small changes that I have to make moving forward in the course. So that's just my disclaimer here. Uh, I don't expect to make any huge changes, but it is something that is going to be in flux constantly. And I'll tell you where those things are really. But uh, I, I might have to make changes every now and then, and I, I will inform you guys of these changes. You're not required to get the text, as I mentioned. Um, calculators, uh, technically not allowed. You might use them on your homework, uh, but for quizzes and tests, I would rather you not do them with a calculator, um, even though I, I won't be able to actually see or stop you, but you know, yeah. Try to do your best to not use a calculator because it's, uh, it's going to impede your progress, let's say, moving forward. Um, this is the usual grade chart. And something I should mention about grades. So for this semester, because everything is online, we are having some changes to the grading policy. Normally, a final exam is worth 40% of your grade. But for this semester, it is worth 50%. And it's going to be worth a higher percentage for as long as we're online. So if in the fall, we continue to be online, chances are your final exam is going to be more than 40%. Also, on top of that, we now have uh, relaxed the requirements for pass fail, which we now call the grade pass slash no credit. So what this guy will allow you to do is it allows you to move forward by just passing the class. And this really means now you only need a D to pass this class, whereas before you needed a C. So if you needed this for your major and you needed this for as a prereq for anything, uh, you needed a minimum of a C to move on, and you had to do that as a letter grade. These requirements are now relaxed, so you can get a pass and then use that to move on. And under normal circumstances where that wouldn't be allowed, it is allowed for the summer. It, it was allowed for the spring, and if we're still online in the fall, I think it will still be allowed in the fall. So that is just uh, something for you to be aware of. So. When it comes to grades, as a, apart from letter grades, which I'll get to that in a second, it is probably best for you to apply for a uh, past fail if you think you're going to fail the course or you, you think you might get around a C or a little bit less or anything in that area. If you're a little bit unsure as to whether your letter grade is going to be good enough, uh, I would I would say you should apply for that grade. I, I do not know if we're still online for the fall. That is something that's still being talked about and discussed. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if we're not, or at least if we would start by going online and then slowly phase things in. It's 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 hard to say. Like no one knows for sure at this point. Okay. But as long as we're in this situation, so that was someone just asking a question in the chat for those of you who can't see it. As long as we're in a situation like this where we are doing distance learning, uh, grades are going to be relaxed in the sense that you can use a pass grade to move on to anything uh, that depends on this course. Yes, I will talk about the dates, the last dates when you can apply for credit and no credit. That's, uh, I'm, I'm going to mention the academic calendar a little bit later on. But yes, there is a deadline. Um, maybe I, it's, it's here somewhere. Ba, ba, ba. Here, July 3rd. So if by July 3rd you're, you're not sure, you feel kind of iffy about things, you know, if you're like you're borderline CD, maybe applying for a pass fail would be in your best interest. If you're getting an A or a B, I would keep the grade. Just, just do everything what you're doing because an A or, or B will, will be 
better for you in the long run. However, if you apply for the credit, no credit grade, then if you fail the class, God forbid, you will not be, your GPA will not be affected by that. And under the circumstances with everything that's going on, in general, it's not going to be looked down upon, you know, under normal circumstances, you know, pass fail. If you get a fail after doing pass fail, it kind of looks bad. But under these circumstances, with all the craziness going on with the virus and the and 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 all this situation, people would really understand if you have to withdraw from a class by taking a credit no credit option. It's a perfectly understandable thing. And so for the time being, there's no bad connotation that comes with that grade. So there are no downsides to it if you feel like uh, things are not so manageable. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on as well. Otherwise, if you are going for a letter grade in this class, which I, of course, I do encourage you to do, um, the, the credit, no credit option is really kind of a, a, a last resort kind of thing. Um, this is the usual grade chart. These are the percentage grades that you need to achieve overall to get the letter grade. And this is the GPA that comes with it. 4.0 is, the, of course, the highest GPA. As mentioned before, the final exam will be worth 50% of your grade. And the other 50% is comprised of uh, in-class assignments, which are the following. So we'll have quizzes, homeworks, and in-class tests for this class as well as the final. So some information about those. In terms of quizzes and tests, everything is going to be online. In terms of the platform that I'm going to give you on quizzes and tests, um, that has not fully been decided. I had a platform that I really liked using and I was using that in the spring, but that is no longer free. Um, that was being offered free uh, to my students in the spring, but as of the summer, I would have to pay for that service and I wouldn't want you guys to have to pay for anything. So I am looking for something else. But as soon as I have a, a, a nice platform to give you quizzes and tests, I will let you guys know what that platform is and what the format of that is going to be. But in general, quizzes will be worth 10%, homework is 10%. In class tests, I'll give you two tests, uh, both combined worth 30% and then the final for 50%. Um, Quizzes are going to be short, they're going to be semi-regularly, and the quizzes and the tests are not cumulative. So normally if I give you a test, if I give you a quiz, it'll be on the material that I covered in the previous week or the previous two weeks or something like that. So whatever I didn't quiz you on since the last test is what the quiz would be on. Um, so they're not cumulative, strictly speaking. And normally there will be short, uh, 10, 15 minute uh, type of things. Homework will be done online. That is through web work. I'll give you instructions for registering for that in a little bit, but that is uh, an online homework system. You will log in with that uh, using your CUNY credentials, and that is, of course, no cost to you. In-class tests, as I mentioned, um, they will be on a platform yet to be announced. There will be two. There will be non-cumulative. I'll talk about what they will cover in a bit. The final is a cumulative exam. It will be departmental in the sense that I will not be writing your final. The course supervisor for the course will be writing your final. As for the platform that the final will be on, that we do know at this point. So um, for the, the final, this is the final. This is on Blackboard. And it will be multiple choice. Right, so that we do know for sure. Um, I would prefer to have some way to assess you guys that is not multiple choice, where I can see you guys showing your work for things of that uh, for for problems. But you know, as I said, I have to find a nice platform where I can get this done. Um, but the final exam for sure is online. It is on Blackboard, and it is multiple choice. Uh, that will be not that will be written by the course supervisor, not by myself. Um, so that is just uh, a little bit about where your grade is going to come from. Um, normal makeup policies, uh, you need a really good reason to make up a test. Uh, in general, I won't make up quizzes and homeworks, but what I will say for the homework, uh, homework, 
if you get uh, 85% overall, I will give you 100% for homework. So of course, homework is online. Um, so inevitably, there are going to be glitches that are going to happen. And so to avoid having to like do too many changes, I will just give you a 15% cushion. So you can mess up 15% of the homework, skip 15% of the problems, and still kind of get a full homework grade. So that is uh, something nice here. So if you get 85% overall on homework, I will give you the full 10% towards your homework grade. Um, I'll talk about homework in a little bit later on. Um, but in general, no makeups for missing quizzes or homeworks because you already have a 15% a, 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 a leeway with homeworks. And for quizzes, I'll drop, uh, I'll drop a quiz. So, uh, but for tests, if you have a very good reason, uh, we can see towards a makeup. Uh, some things that I do want you to realize here. What is this class going to be like? How do you know if you're prepared? I don't know if some of you are nervous about, this, uh, about taking this class, what it's going to be like. For the most part, the class is going to feel like Calculus 2, um, before the new syllabus, in fact. Uh, so we have a new Calculus 2 syllabus, but this is like old school Calc 2, where you did learn a bunch of integration techniques, you learned about series and that sort of thing it's going to have the same sort of feel in the sense that you're going to learn a lot of different methods to solve a lot of different problems and it's going to be a very drilling type of course, right? It's all about drills, solving a lot of problems, solving them efficiently. Um, it's not going to be too conceptual, uh, even though I might talk about concepts and, and theory a little bit. Um, for the most part, this is going to be a computationally driven uh, course. That being said, a multiple choice exam might not focus too much on computation. You are going to know a little bit, of, you need to know a little bit about the concepts to write a more secure multiple choice exam. So I will be mentioning concepts from time to time. But overall, the, the main goal of this course is to really teach you methods of differential equations, methods for solving uh, certain types of differential equations. And in that sense, it's going to feel a lot like Calc 2. It's a very Calc 2-ish. Uh, type course by feel. So if you're very good at Calc 2 or you liked Calc 2, chances are you're going to like this class. All right, so attendance is not really going to be, normally under, under normal circumstances, I will take attendance at the beginning of class. Um, right now your attendance is just going to be judged by uh, the work that you're submitting. So if I realize you're missing a lot of quizzes, you're missing a lot of homeworks, you're missing a lot of tests, under those situations, um, you might get in trouble for attendance. But other than that, um, if you show up often enough, uh, attendance policy is very relaxed. That being said, if you miss too much, you can obtain a WU grade, which is not a great grade. It's a withdrawing unofficially grade. It basically means that the student failed the class because they failed to show up and didn't inform anyone. So to avoid that grade, just show up often enough and submit enough of the work. Um, and we should be fine. Expectations, work ethic, right? Work very hard, uh, don't slack off. In the summer, it, the summer is very intense. That's one thing about the summer. It goes by very quickly. You do not really have time to fall behind and catch up. If you fall behind, it's going to be really, really hard to catch up, much harder than in the uh, regular semester. And normally during the regular semester, we might have a day between classes, here we have back-to-back -back classes. So even though technically speaking, our summer session is about half the length of a regular semester session, it's going to feel almost like it's moving four times as fast because you don't even have a rest between the days. So it's going to be very intense. That being said, uh, if you understand your prerequisites, if you're very good at Calc 2, uh, the course is very manageable. Um, but yes. I expect you to be working on this stuff daily. I expect you to be doing your homework, practicing problems from your textbook, et cetera. Uh, do not fall behind. Uh, prerequisites, so I mentioned some prerequisites before. Pre-calculus, Calc 1, Calc 2. Mostly what you need to know from these classes is, um, 
first of all, how to solve equations. Uh, so you'll need to know about that. How to simplify expressions, how to factor things, how to cancel things and that sort of thing. How to find derivatives and integrals. Um, you don't really need to remember any of your, any of your applications from calculus one. So you don't need to remember about optimization or any of that stuff. Um, but straight up how to compute derivatives, what a derivative is, what it means, that sort of thing. What an integral is, what it means, how to compute them, fundamental theorem of calculus. You need to know a little bit about series, but not even as much as you had to know in Calc 2 or Calc 3. Um, but you do need a little bit of uh, series knowledge for this class, which we will get to. Um, but yes, I expect you to be responsible and uh, brush up on your prerequisites very early. Uh, do not slack off and we will uh, move on. So as far as the homework, here is how you'll access the homework. Like I said, this is a clickable link if you go to the class webpage and actually uh, look at the syllabus. But this is where you will find the homework. At this point, you should be able to log into that website with your CCNY email credentials. So uh, for example, um, my CCNY email address, and remember, do not email me at my CCNY email address, email me at this address if you need to contact me. Um, however, my CCNY email address is jsmith at ccny.cuny.edu. My username would be jsmith, the thing that's in front of the at symbol, right? So that would be your username, and your password is going to be the same as the password used for your email. So the IT department uploaded the rosters to this website so you can log in with your CCNY credentials. What you should be aware of is that the password is always going to coincide with your email password. So, okay. Um, if, if you have trouble trying to log into that website, uh, shoot me an email afterwards, after the class, okay? Or, or shoot me an email at any point, but you have to do it soon. So at some point today, shoot me an email. If you go to that website and you try to log in and you have any issues, shoot me an email. But the login credentials should be your uh, CCNY email username and uh, password. And that being said, the system here, the WebWork system will always coincide with your email password. So for example, if you change your email password, the password here for WebWork will automatically change. And if your password on your email expires, remember it expires every, I forgot what the time limit now is, maybe every 90 days or something like that. If your password on your email expires, you won't be able to log into the homework either. So that would be one of the first troubleshooting things that you would do. So if you can get into the homework system, make sure you can actually log into your city college email. Because if your password isn't working for your email or it has expired, it will not work for the homework system. You'd have to reset your password for the email and then try the homework again. That would, be the, that would be one of the first things I would ask you to do if you are having trouble. But that being said, if you go here, um, hmm, maybe I can show you guys that. Let me show you guys that. Okay, so here we're back on the website. So if you go to the syllabus, here's the syllabus. If we scroll down here, you can click on that. And here you'll see, uh, it should bring you directly to our course. It should say 20 underscore summer 391 underscore one XC. You can log in with your username and password. I have mine saved here. When you log in, you'll see here. Now, as you can see, all the homeworks are already up. So these are all the online homeworks for the entire semester. Um, they weren't compiled by me, so the labeling might look a little bit weird or off. For example, here, when you see EC1, it's because the original instructor that uploaded these uploaded these as an extra credit. But for you guys, it is not extra credit. Everything here is actually due at some point throughout the semester. The orientation is already open and that closes in like a week. So you need to actually do that very early on. That being said, uh, there are a bunch of assignments that are due on the 20th of June. So these are all the assignments that you will need for the first test, okay? And then all the assignments that you will need for the second test, these guys are due on July 11th, right? So you have to get these done in batch. Now, of course, I do recommend that you get the homeworks done as soon as we cover the topic in class. Do not leave it until July 19th to try to get through all the homeworks. 
every time I cover a topic in class, do the homework for that section here. Um, so if you are able to log in, if you go to homework sets, you should be able to see the homework right away. Okay, so that is uh, the homework. Okay, so that's how you should access the homework and homeworks are already posted. Uh, any questions so far on anything? I, I know I'm just rambling, but I just want to give you like an information dump about the class. So if you're having trouble uh, logging to the homework system, shoot me an email. Um, but one of the first things I would ask you to do is actually reset your CC, your CCNY or city mail email account and try to log in again. Um, if you try that and you don't, and you can't get in, shoot me an email. Um, also at this point, you should have received a bunch of emails from me. I, because I, I didn't meet you guys yet, I sent them through a bunch of sources. So I sent you emails through Blackboard, I sent you emails through CUNY first, and I also sent out emails through a program called Jupyter Grades. Now, if Jupyter Grades is the one that I will use to contact you most of the time. So if you did not see an email from me uh, from Jupyter Grades, uh, also shoot me an email and let me know that because if you're missing from that roster, that's going to be an issue. Um, Jupyter Grades is where I will uh, have your report card stored so you can actually see how you're doing in real time. Ah, and that, that answers uh, Rebecca's questions. Uh, so no, I'm not gonna use your uh, Blackboard for your grades. I will use a program called Jupyter Grades, which some of you have probably already seen emails from. Uh, did I mention that in so Yeah, right here, Jupyter Grades. So if you didn't get an email from that, uh, a source called Jupyter Grades, which allows you access to your report card, you should shoot me an email and let me know. All right. Um, let's see. Yes, the numbers after your username is important. So for me, uh, I have a faculty email address, so there are no numbers. But if you have like a 000 at the end of your name or something like that, you need to put in the numbers as well. Yes, yeah, so the full thing before the at symbol in your email. Okay, now let's talk about blasphemies. Okay, so this is a fun part. Let's start to talk about some uh, mistakes that I do not expect anyone in this class to make. Um, so, there are some things at this point which I should think are beyond you. Now, under normal circumstances, well, it, it's going to also be true now, but under normal circumstances, here are some mistakes that if you make them, I would punish you heavily for them. But also, when it comes to something like an online or multiple choice exam, you would also be punished for them because doing them, you'll get the completely the wrong answer. And then uh, on a multiple choice exam, there's no partial credit. So you lose all the credit for making a silly mistake. So there are some silly mistakes, which yes, even in a class like this, I've seen students make. So I do want to make them known what these mistakes are. Uh, so you can't say I never told you, um, but these are some very pervasive mistakes. And they're also just way, way beneath you at this point, or at least they should be. So let's actually talk about some uh, mistakes that causes a lot of people headaches and let's make sure we know what those guys are. So, uh, mistakes to avoid. So one, this is the mistakes called canceling across sums do not do this. What does canceling across sums mean? Okay, so for example, uh, let's say you have, say, 2x plus 1 all over 2. And you, you're working on a problem, you eventually get to a line that looks like that, and you're like, oh, I can cancel the 2s, can't I? No, you cannot cancel the 2s.
This is called canceling cross sums. You're not allowed to cancel because of this plus sign being there. Um, so that is a very common mistake that you should not make. And it's really uh, uh, something that should be behind you at this point. You're allowed to cancel only across multiplication and division. So if there are parentheses here, uh, yes, this is allowed. Right? So assume it might see something like this. They'll cancel the twos, and then they'll end up with, they'd write something like x plus 1 as the answer. Now, of course, uh, in a multiple choice exam, that would be one of the answer choices, just to try to catch you to see if you tried to cancel across twos, uh, across sums. And yeah, you'll get the problem wrong, as opposed to this is a correct situation where you can cancel. So do not cancel across sums, uh, very bad mistake. And in any case, you're going to be punished very heavily for making it. Um, another common mistake that you should never make uh, is distributing powers across sums. And probably I should uh, put a warning here. Do not cancel cross sum. Do not. So this is one of the don'ts that we're looking at. What would this look like? This is, looks like something like if a student sees an x plus uh, 2 all squared, and then they write, oh, well, that's just x squared plus 4, isn't it? Well, no, it's not x squared plus 4. This is called distributing a power across a sum. You can't take a power and attach it to things once there is a plus or a minus sign separating the things. You are not allowed to do that. Um, another way that this crops up is with radicals. Students often forget that. So sometimes you have like an x squared plus 4. And the students would write, oh, is that x plus 2? No, that is not x plus 2. Um, in fact, in the new Calculus 2 syllabus, you'll actually learn how to expand radicals like this. And you should know that you will need an infinite number of terms to actually do it. So you're missing a lot here. Um, but you should remember that a radical is just a power in disguise. So you cannot. You cannot distribute the half. Okay, that is not allowed. Um, you can distribute powers across uh, products, right? So if you have like two times x all squared, you can do that. That's four x squared and division. So that's allowed. So if you have it like an x over two all squared, that's allowed. But if there's a plus or a minus sign separating terms, you cannot distribute a power. Um, so that is another rookie mistake that you do want to avoid at all costs. Um, the last one, very strange, don't divide by zero. Also, So if you have like one over zero or anything like that, it does not make any sense. And if you're taking limits, hopefully you guys know how to deal with limits. I'm not gonna go over those guys, but, um, but I also expect you to know uh, how to deal with what's called indeterminate forms. I.e. If you have a limit that approaches one of the forms, like a zero over zero. So you're taking a limit and the top and the bottom are approaching zero or infinity over infinity or one to the infinity or infinity to the zero or infinity minus infinity, um, or zero to the zero, or anything of that nature, right? So I do expect you to know how to do with these. In Calc 1, you learned L'Hopital's rule, which is how you're, you would, would deal with these guys. Um, but be careful when dividing by zero. Uh, you should know how to deal with limits and that sort of thing, and don't think division by zero computationally makes any sense. I've seen students try to divide by zero all the time. Um, 
which is uh, very strange. Another thing, uh, this is sort of a do. I, I could express it in terms of a do not, but uh, it's probably nicer to uh, express it as a do. Use parentheses uh, appropriately. So a lot of times students will uh, appropriately. A lot of times students will actually neglect to write down their parentheses, even though they kind of, they say they know to use it in their head, but they don't. Um, so use your parentheses, uh, don't be lazy, and in general, use proper notation. When it comes to math, you can get into a lot of trouble by using incorrect notation. You'll be surprised. Um, uh, in language, you can have bad grammar and you can still kind of get an idea across. But in math, if you have bad grammar, quote unquote, uh, you can actually get into a lot of trouble and actually completely get a problem wrong just because you were sloppy in how you wrote things down. Um, another thing, do not, so, the, the, and, and I mean, these are especially for people who have been out of school for a while. Uh, do not distribute integrals or derivatives across products or quotients. So also don't do that. Remember, the product rule is a thing, the quotient rule is a thing, uh, integration by parts are things. So if you have the derivative of one function times another function, it is not just taking the derivative of this and multiplying by a derivative of that. That is incorrect. Also, if you have an integral of one function times another function, it is not the integral of one fun this function times the integral of that function. That is also incorrect, okay? So we do have product rule for derivatives, expect you to remember that, how to use it. We have quotient rule for derivatives, expect you to remember that, how to use it. For integration, it can be a little bit trickier. We have substitution, uh, integration by parts, various integration techniques. I do expect you to remember all your integration techniques, so you should know how to do trig integrals, basic integrals, integration by parts, integration by substitution, partial fractions, trig substitution. Uh, am I forgetting any? Yeah, because I think trig integrals has a whole bunch of techniques within there. But uh, I expect you to remember all your integration techniques uh, and use them properly and not do things like try to distribute a derivative or an integral across a product that is uh, no bueno. Now, another thing, Now, you might recall that if I were to take the antiderivative of 1 over x dx, uh, what is that, by the way? Antiderivative of 1 over x. Let's make sure that you guys aren't falling asleep. Ln x? No. We're off by a, a, a couple technicalities here. Ln x plus c. Ah, Hillary got it. Ln of the absolute value of x plus c. The absolute value of x is important. Right? It's a, it's a very common thing to forget that. Don't forget that. Plus c is also important. I think I also mentioned that in the syllabus. Don't forget your plus c when you're doing an indefinite integral. You also do not want to forget it here because those plus c's are going to be, uh, again, a source of a lot of mistakes. We're going to be taking indefinite integrals all the time in this class. And sometimes not having a plus c can totally, uh, it, it's a really big deal at the end of the day. Um, it can it really change the landscape of a problem. Now, here's, here's a situation. Here's what you do not want to do. Do not misuse this, i.e. 
a common mistake is for students to think that one over anything is just ln of the thing. And that is simply not true, right? You have to have one over some linear function to get ln in there, or you have to be able to do a substitution to get it to a linear function. It has to look linear in the denominator. So if you, if you have something like one over x squared, the antiderivative of that is not ln of x squared. You'd actually rewrite that as x to the minus two. And so that would be the integral, no ln involved. Or if you have something like one over secant, right? The integral of that is not ln of secant. You just realize, well, that's another way of writing cosine. And the integral of cosine is positive sine, right? So ln does not always come into play once you have one over something, but that is a very common thing for students to mess up. Um, and we are going to be looking at integrals like this all the time as well. It's not a mistake that you do want to uh, get yourself into. So be sure that when you're applying this rule for LNs, you apply it properly, right? So that's another thing. And those are just some common mistakes. I think those are all of them. And I listed them here in the syllabus. Very important that you avoid them. And I mentioned here, mistakes like this I see students making all the time, mistakes like this I see students making all the time, forgetting your plus C, I see students forgetting all the time. And that, that the plus C, back in Calc 1 when you forgot the plus C, I understand it really didn't seem like a big deal because the answer wasn't much different. It was just like missing a plus C. But in this class, if you forget that plus C, those plus Cs can morph into things later on in the problem. And so if you have that guy missing, it can literally change everything about a problem as you're moving on. So you have to be very careful. So these are some common mistakes that you should definitely avoid. And they're definitely you, you do have the ability to avoid them. If you've made it this far, uh, it shouldn't be something. But again, some of that students, especially if I have students here that have not been in, in, in a class, a math class for a while, these are things you might have forgotten, but they're very important things to pay attention to. Contact. So I have mentioned to you guys before that I reached out to you via Jupiter grades. I will be contacting you by email from time to time. So you do want to make sure that I have your email and that I have, uh, and you ha are receiving messages from me from Jupyter Grades. Um, so that's very important. I'll be sending in any important announcements via email. So make sure that I have an up to date email for you. Right now, the email that I'm using for everyone is the email that is on CUNY First. That's the email listserv that I'm using. If for some reason that email address that is in CUNY First is not the best way to reach you, let me know. Reach out to me and let me know. Moving on, it is the summer, it is going to be intense. So you might need help at some point and there's nothing wrong with needing help. So I, here are some resources that can help you with this course. And I don't know if anyone's taking more than one math courses, but uh, yeah, here are some resources that you can get help from. So one, first of all, there is me. You can always reach out to me via email. Remember the email at the top of the syllabus. Um, and we can set up an appointment, we can do a, a Zoom chat, and we can, uh, I can use OneNote and we can have a meeting and we can talk about whatever issues. In general, I would also say that if you have any issues that are not of a mathematical nature, but they will affect you, you need to let me know about it. You do not need to, you don't need to give me any details. Uh, you don't have to feel like this is an invasion of privacy. But if there's anything happening in your life where you know, oh, I'm going to miss a bunch of tests, I'm going to miss a bunch of assignments, or I'm just not going to perform very well, you need to reach out to me and let me know. One of the worst things you can do is just fall off the grid, right? So yes, I know life can be tough, especially in 2020. And crazy things can happen at a moment's notice. But try to have the wherewithal to just like shoot off an email to me it takes five minutes and just let me know, hey, Javon, I'm sorry I haven't been attending class. I'm sorry I missed test one. Here's what's going on. I blah, blah, blah. And we'll figure out a plan. If you, I would recommend that you withdraw from the course, I'll tell you that and after discussing it with you and so on and so forth. But if you have any issues at all with this class or with uh, having 
uh, or anything in your life is going to affect your performance in this class, it's best to keep me in the loop. Shoot me an email, it takes a couple minutes, and I will help you work through whatever issues you, will, you are having. Or if I can't help you, I will direct you to somewhere that can help you. But do not uh, suffer in quiet desperation or fall off the grid and just not let, not tell anyone about it. You do not want that to happen. It's just going to cause a lot of uh, headaches and issues that it's going to be really annoying to fix down the road. Um, so yes, contact me, reach out to me if you have any issues. Of course, with the subject material of the class, but also with anything that might affect your performance in the class. Um, the class website is an important resource as well. I showed you guys that earlier. I'll be posting, updating that website from time to time with things that will help you prepare for quizzes and tests and so on and so forth. Free tutoring is available. Uh, you can go to this link to find out uh, information on how you'd access that. Of course, that is also online. And I believe they also use an online platform like Zoom or GoBoard or something similar to that. Um, you can go here for information. Many other online resources, uh, their math forms, Math Stack Exchange, Wolfram Alpha, love that, Symbol Lab, love that. I use these two sites like all the time. Um, and Symbol Lab has the added benefit that it can also show you steps if you want to check your work for something and you want to make sure that you understand. Graph.tk or Desmos, if you can use that for graphing. But of course, there are other things like Khan Academy, Paul's Online Notes. Google is your friend, a quick Google search can do wonders. Uh, and of course, if you, if you for some reason can't uh, meet with a tutor doing their available hours or for some reason you can't meet with me to go over one problem or you need just some resources to, for self-help, uh, that's what this bullet point is about here. Uh, your classmates are also an important resource. So what we can do is uh, someone can set up like a, a group chat in Blackboard or something or a group chat and we can post the link here and you guys can uh, get the contact information of someone else in the class that you can bounce ideas off or if you're missing or you don't understand something. Sometimes just having another human being to bounce ideas off is a very good thing. So your classmates might be another very important source. I also saw, already saw people helping each other out in the chat section uh, with tips. So you never know, you, your fellow classmates might have a lot of uh, helpful tips for you. So they're also a very important resource. So you are not alone. Um, so just to be aware of that, moving down, moving on to the next page. Okay, so uh, we also have a disability services office here at City College. Uh, if you have a disability that you think will affect your performance in the class, you should definitely reach out to them within the first week of class. You can go uh, reach out to them via this email, this uh, website here, which will link you to uh, contact information for them. So you do want to do that because to receive any accommodations, I will have to have correspondence with them to actually set it up. So you need to get things set up with them if you um, need to do that. Uh, normal academic integrity policy here, if I catch you cheating at any point, of course, I'm going to fail you and worse things can potentially happen. So don't cheat. There is really no need to cheat. This class isn't the hardest thing around. It will be an okay class. It'll be a very good class if you put in the work uh, and just uh, keep your head down and keep working. It's really not one of those crazy classes. Like I said, as far as level of difficulty is concerned, it's very, it feels very around a Cal 2 level. So it's, it's, it will, if you loved Calc 2, it's great, but also in hindsight, Calc 2 should look a lot easier now than it has been. And so there's really no reason uh, to uh, not brush up on this stuff and do well. It, it's possible for everyone once you're actually here. Um, of course, there's some more advice here. Believe in yourself. I, mean, I know it sounds cheesy, but another thing that I mentioned before, don't give in to despair. Uh, if you're having a rough time with something, don't uh, just, uh, oh, no, I, I guess I can't do this. Da, da, da. And then you start dropping the class. You stop doing assignments. I've had students, this happened to students uh, over the years, even this semester, where they just, they lost hope at some point and they stopped trying. And it's, and it's like, there are so many other students who were doing bad 
in the beginning and they ended up doing really well in the class. Like you could have improved. Um, so yeah, work hard, work smart, uh, believe in your ability to improve, reach out for help when you need it. Uh, and listen to advice as I will be giving you throughout the semester. I'll give you a lot of advice as we go on. As you can probably tell from this introduction, I, I'm all about just talking and giving you guys more information than you can probably handle. So I'll definitely give you all the information that you will need to pass this class and do well. Pay attention, follow my advice, and uh, yeah, work hard and smart. Here are some important dates from the academic calendar. You can find the full academic calendar here. Last day of classes is July 20th, and your final exams are the 21st through the 23rd. Our final exam is on the 23rd. Uh, last day to drop a class is here, as mentioned before earlier. The last day for the pass or no credit option is July 3rd, so be aware of that. And W grades begin on June 11th. So if you have to withdraw with a W, um, you can do that. Although under the circumstances, it's probably even better to do a pass fail than it is to do a W. Um, but uh, of course, if you're thinking about withdrawing or you're thinking about going pass fail, or again, any issues or insecurities you have regarding this class, reach out to me, shoot me an email, tell me what you're worried about. We will figure out a solution together. Okay, I'm here for you. That's why I'm here. That's a part of my job is to make sure that you guys, facilitate you guys learning the material and to make sure that I can help you guys achieve a successful completion to the course. It is why I'm here. Reach out to me if you have any issues. We will figure something out, okay? Um, so if you need to, if you're thinking about applying for a W grade, you're thinking about withdrawing from the course, or you're thinking about applying for pass fail, reach out to me. Ask me if you think it's a good idea or what you need to consider and all that good stuff. I will be here to help you out. So that's important. Now, uh, the next page of the syllabus, which I believe is, yeah. I believe is the topics list. So these are the topics that we will be covering throughout the semester. Okay. So what we'll see here, there are, these are some practice problems from the 10th edition of the text. These are the topics. Um, and here you can see where the locations of your tests will show up. So the first exam will cover everything from topics one through 16, at least that is the hope. So, and that will occur. The date is set in stone. The topics might not, I might uh, test you a little bit earlier than topic 16, but uh, the date is definitely set in stone. Your first test is on June 25th. Um, and again, I will reach out to you before that, way before that, as to what platform and the format of that test is going to be. Um, but the first test is going to cover uh, these topics in general. The second test covers all topics covered after the first test, and that will be on July 16th. And you should notice that your homeworks for all these topics are due just before this uh, test here. So I believe the first set of homeworks are due uh, on June 20th. And so you have five days after that to study, hit the test. Uh, and the next uh, set of homeworks is due July 10th or something like that, or 12 or, or whatever. You, if you log into web work, you'll see what the grades are, the, what the due dates are. So that's when your first test is, that's when your second test is. This is when our final is, July 23rd, 5 to 7, 15 p.m. So make sure you mark your calendar, save the date. And so this is essentially what we're going to go through. And we will start with 1.1 tomorrow. Um, although I'll talk about some more things. Uh, last but not least, normally I have students fill out a questionnaire in class, but of course, I cannot fill out a questionnaire in class. And uh, so what I would like you guys to do instead is to fill out this questionnaire online. So I posted a link to this uh, questionnaire. So I would like you guys to uh, go to the chat, click on that link, fill out the questionnaire. And um, yeah. In the meantime, 
uh, you can ask me questions in the meantime while you're filling those out. Uh, there are some questions here in the chat that I guess I will answer. So we will not be able to do credit, no credit after the grades are posted like last semester. So no, as far as I know, the last day for credit, no credit is July 3rd for the summer. Um, for, the, for the spring, yes, they allowed you to apply for credit, no credit after the final grades were posted. I don't think that is still in effect. So there is a point in the middle of the semester, which is the last point to apply for credit, no credit. Any other questions? Before we move on. Yeah, so overall, those are the rules. These are your grades, common mistakes to avoid, important dates, topics lists with practice problems. Okay, so someone also asked about attendance. So um, when you register for this Zoom class, I will use that list to take attendance. Um, this is very important in the beginning of the semester because by end of next week, I think roughly, I need to submit the roster to CUNY first so I know, so they know what students are actually showing up to class. So that's going to be very important. So it's very important that I know that you started attending the class. Other than that, excessive absences usually result in a WU grade. So that's a withdraw unofficially grade. And I will be forced to give that to you for anyone who has excessive absences. Now, for the most part, as the semester progresses, how I will judge absences is mostly by how much work you're putting in. So there are a bunch of uh, homework assignments, there are a bunch of quizzes, there are a bunch of tests. If I realize that you're missing an excessive amount of these assignments, I think that's enough for me to uh, give you a grade. But of course, uh, strictly speaking, uh, I'm not going to be taking attendance at the beginning of every class as I normally would be during the regular semester. So that's what you need to know about attendance. Any other questions? Yeah, so in the beginning, I'm going to count attendance by who is registering for the Zoom class. Because, uh, like I said, there, I have to officially submit the roster uh, within the next week or, or so. So that's how attendance will be taken. But if we, there is a midway point or towards the end of the semester, I'm looking over and I realize, oh, this person isn't doing test one. They didn't take a bunch of quizzes. They're not doing any of the homework, right? So if you miss more than like five assignments, that's enough for me to be like, well, this person isn't attending anymore. They're not putting in the work, it's just not, it's not there. So I will use your assignments to judge attendance towards the later, latter end of the course. But in the beginning, I'll be using uh, who's attending the Zoom chats, the Zoom meetings. That being said, attendance isn't a part of your official grade. So you're not getting credit. Normally during the semester, I actually give students credit for attendance, but I understand with everything that's going on, there might be legitimate reasons for missing class um, 
based on some emergency that's happening. And so I'm not going to be super strict with attendance, but the more you show up, the better for you. Attendance is highly correlated with having better grades. Okay, as for how quizzes and tests will work, like I said, I have to update you guys on that later because I'm looking into some other platforms that I'd like to use. I had a platform I was using in the spring that I could give quizzes and tests on, but it's no longer free to students. It was free for the spring and I don't want you guys to have to pay for anything. So I'm trying to find a free solution that would also work for submitting written work. Okay. So I can give quizzes and tests through Blackboard. I can also give quizzes and tests through web work, but it's not very efficient for submitting written work. So I want a platform that can ideally handle both of these types of assignments. And yes, on the survey I'm referring to, well, I'm referring to if you've ever taken any of the classes. I, I don't particularly care if it was high school or college, but the college classes will um, supersede. See, so yeah, in the questionnaire, I asked you to rate your proficiency on pre-calc, calc one, calc two, et cetera. Uh, if you've taken these in college, I would ask you to judge by the college performance, not by high school performance. Okay, so hopefully you guys are almost uh, wrapping up with the questionnaire. So um, as long as you submit that at some point today, it's fine. Um, but I guess we can move on. Let's actually start the fun a little bit. Start talking about what this class is gonna be about, uh, kind of give you a feel for where we're going. Um, so, in the few remaining minutes, we're going to talk about what are differential equations and why should we care? I'll also talk about uh, kind of how we're going to proceed to study uh, differential equations. So essentially, as you can see here, a differential equation is any equation involving derivatives. So there's an equation that you have that it has derivatives in the equation. Okay, so if you only have like ordinary derivatives and you only have a single variable function, you have one independent variable and one dependent variable, and you only have ordinary derivatives, these are called ordinary differential equations or ODEs for short. And here are some examples like y double prime minus 3xy prime minus uh, 7y equals 7x. As you can see here, there are derivatives present, right? So. I wanted that to be in a different color. Okay. As you can see here and here, derivatives are present. Okay. So these are examples of A and here. Boom. You see that dy dx. There's a derivative. So here I have an equation and there are derivatives in the equation. That's essentially all a differential equation is. An equation that involves derivatives of a function as well as the function itself and its independent variables. In a situation where you have several independent variables and you have partial derivatives, this is called a partial differential equation. The short for that is PDE. So if someone says ODE, they're talking about ordinary differential equation. If someone says PD, they're talking about a partial differential equation. And the only difference is between these two is that one has just ordinary regular derivatives that you would have seen in calculus one, and the other one has partial derivatives that you would see in a multivariable calculus course. Okay, so that's when you have more than one independent variable and you have to worry about who you're taking the derivative with respect to. These give rise to PDEs. So that's essentially what a differential equation is. That's what it is. Um, now the thing is, 
our goal is to be able to solve differential equation. That's the goal for this class. We're going to find about a variety of ways to actually solve differential equations. And I'll talk about what does it mean to solve a differential equation if I didn't mention it yet. But um, let's actually talk about why would we care about such equations? Or why do I care if there's an equation where the derivative, where would such an equation even come from? Um, and this is why you should care. Um, differential equations are actually very applicable. Um, there are a lot of physical phenomena and a lot of other models that we can come up for with that would involve differential equations. Pretty much any scenario where you can imagine a rate of change being a part of the discussion, chances are somewhere in there, you would have a differential equation. Uh, a lot of you at this point would have already taken something like physics one, chapter one in physics, that's all differential equations. When you were learning the equations of motion, they were derived using differential equations, right? You started out with acceleration, you had to integrate it to get to uh, velocity, you had to integrate that to get to position. These are things you were doing a long time ago, and it turns out that you were actually playing around with differential equations. Physics starts out with differential equations, even though they don't really say that. Differential equations are all around, they're very important. And PDEs are very, very important. When it comes to applied math, differential equations, PDEs, uh, probability and statistics, these are the main uh, math classes that you would need to kind of go into an applied sense. You want to affect change in the real world, a, a knowledge of differential equations is going to be very important. So they are actually very important. And it turns out that it's very common for these equations to show up just by you trying to describe some natural phenomenon, right? You can describe something. So I will give you guys a concrete example here. Newton's law of cooling, some of that you guys, some of you probably have seen before. Newton's law of cooling. So Isaac Newton was uh, investigating temperature change a long, long time ago, and he kind of figured out something that was interesting, okay? So here's a, par a, a description in a paragraph of the kind of thing that he realized, and I'll, we'll kind of show how a differential equation kind of uh, came out of this. So here's something that Newton realized, right? So he realized, and he's not the first or only person to realize this, but it's, it's called Newton's law of cooling, so I'm just gonna use Newton as the example here. So Newton noticed that the hotter objects were, the faster they would actually cool down, right? And this is something that he did with experiments, right? So he could measure the temperature of an object. Some time would pass, he would measure the temperature again, some more time would pass, he would measure the temperature again. Some more time would pass, he would measure the temperature again. What he'll notice is that between successive measurements, right? So let's say he's measuring at a regular time interval. He would notice that the temperature difference between earlier time intervals, they were much larger than the temperature differences between later time intervals, meaning an object would you lose many degrees of uh, temperature early on and lose relatively fewer degrees of temperature as time progresses. So you notice the hotter the thing is, the faster it's actually cooling down. Um, so what you'll notice is that a an object will change temperature to match its surrounding temperature. And this is from law of third thermodynamics. You don't, don't need to know about that. But in general, you take a hot object, put it into a cold environment. The heat is going to uh, leave the object and the object will slowly uh, try to match the temperature of the surroundings. Now, the hotter that object is, the quicker it will move to match the temperature of its surroundings. And this was something that Newton noticed. Another way of saying this is that the rate of change of the temperature, it matches the difference between the temperature of the object and the temperature of the surroundings. And in fact, through his experiments, Newton figured out that this relationship was linear. Like there was, they served a linear relationship. So here you have this scientist, he was studying how temperature changes, uh, temperature changes of an object, and he realized this idea. Hey, it seems that the hotter things are, the faster they cool down. And the colder things are, the faster they would heat up, right? So this is just something you know about the natural world, okay? This is just a, a, a thing that exists now. 
how do we make this mathematical? How do we come up with a mathematical model to describe something like that? Well, the moment you start saying, oh, this moves faster or this moves slower, you will realize from Calc 1 that you're now getting into the realm of derivatives. Derivatives measure rates of change. Derivatives tells us how fast things move. And so once you start to come up with some sort of description of reality that depends on rates of change, a derivative is a natural mathematical object used to describe that thing. And so what you would have here, if Newton tried to express this fact that he just noticed, how would he express it? Well, if we set, uh, let T, um, so here's what you can do. Set T equals time. Um, and set big T equals temperature of the object. And set T, there are many notations for this, but I, I use T sub A and B. This is what, with this, let me move the chat box out of the way here. This is what's called the ambient temperature. It's another way, it's a fancy way of saying surrounding temperature. Okay. What Newton noticed is that uh, if, I, if I think of T, think of T as a function of time. So time is his independent variable. So it's big T of little t. And so what he noticed is that the rate of change of the temperature with respect to time, right? This is T prime. It is actually proportional to the difference in temperature between the temperature of the object and the temperature of the surroundings. Take that difference, the rate of change of temperature is going to be a constant multiple of that. And we normally put a minus sign here. This, this guy here, this law is called Newton's law of cooling. Okay. So he noticed, you know what? And, 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 and we, we put this negative sign here. That sometimes confuses students. Why is there a negative sign here? Well, we put the negative there because it makes a lot more sense if you think of, about it from a, 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 a physical standpoint. Normally, this constant K will depend on the materials of the object and, the, and how insulated it is, what the material is, how its conductivity, all that good stuff. Um, but we normally want to think of that as a positive number. And so what you'll notice here is if the temperature of the object is higher than the temperature of the surroundings, then your T minus T ambient is going to be a positive number. And what will happen is that the temperature is going to actually decrease, which is why the negative sign is here. So then your T prime is going to be negative and you get a decreasing temperature, which makes sense in the physical model. As opposed to if the big T is smaller than the surrounding temperature, that means it's going to heat up. It would also mean that this here is going to be negative and then the negative times the negative is going to make it positive, which tells you the rate of change of temperature is increasing. Um, so this is something that Newton realized. After tracking temperatures of the temperature of an object over time, he realized that the hotter the, the, hotter the object was, the faster it will cool down. But also by tracking the numbers, he understood that this difference, this was the rate of change of the temperature was proportional to the difference in temperature. Right? So the larger the difference in temperature, the larger the rate of change of the, uh, of the object. Right? And so just being able to express that in mathematical language gave rise to this equation. And hey, what you'll notice here is there is a derivative in this equation. It is a differential equation. This is an ordinary differential equation because I only have one independent variable, little t, and I have one dependent variable, big t. Right? So this is a situation in which we naturally have 
an ordinary differential equation just popping up out of nowhere. Now, we will talk about Newton's law of cooling in more detail later on, as well as some other applications of, derivative, of differential equations. But this is just one that I, I think it's, it's low hanging fruit. I can throw it out there. It's a very cool example to, to talk about where you can kind of see where a differential equation might pop up, right? And yeah, so that's where an equation might pop up. You're just studying something in physical reality and you realize describing in terms of rates of change is very convenient and a differential equation just naturally pops up, right? So yeah, that's why differential equations are useful. You'll see them all over the place. They're highly applicable, so applicable. Um, and even by the end of this class, you will not have a, as much appreciation for how applicable these things are, but you will have some uh, appreciation. We're going to do some applications here, um, and you will see how differential equations are used to describe physical reality in some situations. But believe me, the applications abound way beyond that. Uh, it's, it's crazy how applicable these guys are. And yeah, when a lot of times when people think about applied math, they think probability and statistics, but differential equations and PDEs are actually a huge chunk of applied math as well. So rest assured, these things are important. Understanding differential equations, if you're a scientist or, or an engineer, is important, and for many other people as well. So uh, yeah, I guess I just went on a spiel for 20 minutes to try to convince you that this class is actually important. It is important. Uh, these things do show up, right? Um, and it is, at least in ideas, it is something that you will be using in the future. Uh, so that's important. Now, how is the differential equation useful? Uh, this comes down to what we can get by solving the differential equation. So now I want to talk a little bit about what does it mean to solve a differential equation? Okay, I described some physical phenomena. I end up describing it in terms of derivatives. I have this equation. What do I do with it? Well, it turns out you can solve differential equations, just like how you can solve another differential equation, solve regular equations. And you might say, well, what does it mean to actually solve a differential equation? Well, okay, so here's Newton, right? He was measuring the temperature of this object. He came up with this uh, model for the temperature change. What if Newton wanted to talk about the temperature of the object that he was measuring without the need to talk about the rate of change of temperature? What if temperature was the goal? I don't care about the rate of change of temperature. I care about the temperature, right? So now what would be nice, is there a way to express a relationship between the big T and the little t that does not involve a derivative? What if I don't want to talk about rates of change? I actually want to talk about the objects that are in play, right? So I actually want to talk about temperature. I care about temperature, not the rates of change of temperature. When you do that, if given a differential equation, you derive some equation from that that does not have a derivative in it, but it relates all the variables in play, this is called a solution to the differential equation, right? So if you wanted to find some function of t that does not involve a derivative, that describes the temperature change of an object, you would have to solve this differential equation. And that's really what it means to solve a differential equation. It means to find a relationship between the variables that does not involve derivatives. Now, sometimes you, it's nice if you can do this explicitly. You can say big T equals this function of T and you can write it down. But sometimes it's very difficult to get an explicit relationship. Sometimes you have to get an implicit relationship and Hopefully you guys remember what implicit and explicit functions are. Uh, it'll come up later, so I'll talk about it if you don't remember. Um, but getting to a point where you don't have derivatives to talk about, and you can describe the quantities without the need of describing their derivatives, that is what it means to solve a differential equation. This class is about doing that. I'm going to give you specific types of differential equations, and I'm going to teach you how to solve them. How do you actually get from a situation where derivatives are there to a situation where they're not there, where I can talk about it? One way method is separation of variables. And again, we'll talk about this again in more detail in a later class, 
I'm just doing a little bit of an intro here for you guys to kind of see where we're going with this. So separation of variables is one method for solving differential equations. It's going to be one of the first methods we're going to do. So here's how that method uh, kind of works. Or here is essentially how it works, which we'll talk about later on. Um, separation of the variables, as the name suggests, means you want to separate the variables. In other words, separate the dependent variables from the independent variables. Also, I want you to note that T, A, and B is a constant here. It's the surrounding temperature. Okay, so separate the variables means get all the big T's on one side and all the little T's on the other side, right? So that's, you literally separate the variables. That's, that's what it's about. Here's one way to do this. What we can do is I can divide by T minus T, A, and B, assuming the difference in temperature is not zero. and multiply by dt, um, what you'll notice now, uh, the variables are separated. And at this point, what I can do, because the dt's are here, they kind of beg to have an integral in front of them. Right? So this allows me to do an integral of both sides. Uh, so, Here's where you guys chime in to make sure you're not falling asleep. What is the integral of this? One over T minus T ambient. What would be the integral of that? And I, I think I'm gonna need more space here. Okay, that's you guys, chime in. No. No, other guesses? Right, so this is a logarithm. So you will do a substitution, u equals t minus t a and b, du would be dt, big T. Uh, then you'd have the integral of one over u. Ultimately, this becomes ln of that in absolute values. On this side, it's kt plus a constant. Now, there is a plus c that on this side as well, but we move it to the right side. Move all uh, chain rule is a derivative technique. Yeah, so you, you wouldn't do chain rule here. Technically, you reverse the chain rule. That's what substitution is. So move all constants of integration. To the right side. So remember, when you integrate the left side, you'll get a plus C, call that plus C1. Then when you integrate the, the left side, you'll get a plus C, plus C2. Uh, bring them over, take C1 plus C2, and I call that big C. Now what I can do, notice this equation now has no derivatives present, and I can actually solve this. I can solve this by taking exponential of both sides. On this side, I would get a T minus T A and B, because the E's and LN's will cancel. On this side, be very careful with the plus C, uh, this is a constant times E to the minus KT, right? And, and that's because since if you have E to the minus KT plus a constant, this is E to the minus KT times a constant, E to the constant, and this is just e to the minus kt times a constant. So I just took e to the constant and I wrote it as another constant. 
Um, and it's not very, it's not very uh, important for you to separate the constants like C1, C2, C3. If there's just one big constant moving around, just you can call it C all the time. Uh, you'll be able to solve for it later to be whatever value you want. But ultimately, what you'll notice now I can do is T of T is equal to C E to the minus K T plus T A and B. Now notice that here, what we have, equation with no derivatives. So I started out with a differential equation, right? I started out with a differential equation. Through a certain method, in this particular case, separation of variables, I was able to take that situation and move into a situation where there are no derivatives. Here I have an equation that relates the big T and the little t all in one equation, and there are no derivatives present. So this is the solution to the Newton's cooling. ODE, okay? So this is what it means to solve a differential equation. So a differential equation is an equation that naturally arises that has derivatives in it. If you move into a situation where there are no longer derivatives present, but you have a relationship between all the other variables, that relationship is called the solution to the differential equation. Now, the differential equation and the solution, they are equivalent, right? Meaning, Whenever this, whenever this equation works, then that equation should work as well. I don't know why I keep clicking the wrong thing. Then this equation should work as well, right? So if, uh, if I were to start with this, and if I were to take a derivative of both sides, take DDT of both sides, it turns out, Maybe, maybe I can show you guys that as well. I mean, and then we'll wrap up. Here's something you can note. If we start with big T equals C E to the minus K T uh, plus T A and B, and I take a derivative, differentiate both sides. with respect to t. What I would get is dt little t. On this side, the derivative of this. What's the derivative of that? How do you differentiate e to the minus kt with respect to t? Right, so that's minus k c e to the minus k t. Now, of course, the t a and b is uh, gone because that's a constant. So you'll have this. Now, what I want you to notice is that this is the same as I'm going to. Add T A and B and subtract T A and B. And you'll see why I'm doing that in a second. Now, what you'll notice is that this part here is your original T. So, what this actually is, it's minus K times T, because that's the T, minus T A and B. And you'll notice that the derivative is here. So the ODE can be recovered. Um, so the ODE and its solutions are equivalent. 
you can go from one to the other. But of course, there are scenarios in which you would not want a description with a derivative in it. You just want to know an equation that only has the actual variables in play. Tell me about the temperature of the object. I don't care how fast it's changing. Tell me about its current temperature right now. Whenever you ask a question like that, you want the solution to the differential equation. The differential equation only tells you about the relationship when the rate of change is involved. Okay, so this is the solution to the differential equation. It's equivalent. These, you can go back and forth between these two, but that's what it means to solve a differential equation. So overall, that is essentially what this class is going to be about. I am going to tell you about various kinds of differential equations because it turns out we can't solve most of them that arise in nature. I'll talk about that as time goes on. But uh, there are a lot of scenarios in which we know how to deal with. And this class is about teaching you about these scenarios, teaching you about what we know about differential equations in general, uh, where our limitations are, where are there are gaps in our knowledge, what we know, what we don't know. And I'm going to teach you methods to solve differential equations, methods to uh, read uh, certain applications, construct differential equations that describe them, and then solve these equations, right? That's what this class is about, teaching you methods on solving differential equations. These guys naturally arise, they're highly applicable, and these are just equations with derivatives in them. Bringing them to a situation where there are no derivatives is called solving the differential equation, quote unquote. Many methods to do this. One of them was separation of variables with it, which I showed you guys here, but we'll go over that again. So notice what happened here also. Notice that you had to remember what is the integral of this. You had to remember uh, laws of exponents right here. Um, I have to close the parentheses. You have to remember laws of exponents. You have to remember your exponential rule. You have to remember a bunch of things that you should have known from Calc 2, right? So individually, any of the one steps that I took here aren't very difficult, but if you don't remember your Calc 2, there's no way you would have gotten from the first step to the last step, right? So this is what I mean. You need to brush up on your prerequisites, make sure you're good at calculus, make sure you know how to differentiate, make sure you know how to integrate, make sure you know how to solve equations. Notice from here, if you had this scenario before I threw in the E's, would you have known to raise both sides to the E? Right, if you didn't know that's how you would have solved for the big T, that's a problem. And that's a problem that you need to correct immediately. Go back and learn how to solve exponential and log equations. Those are gonna come up all the time. Know how to solve quadratic equations. Know how to solve uh, polynomial equations in general. Know how to uh, simplify things. Know how to find derivatives, find integrals all your derivative techniques, all your integration techniques, all your computational methods that you've learned in Calc 1 and Calc 2, they will come uh, in effect in this class. And so if you're falling behind in this class, that's where the issue is going to happen. It's actually, your issue is not with this class, it's with the previous class, right? It's kind of like the same thing with calculus. Like if, you, if you're having problems in calculus one, your issue is really algebra, it's not calc one. So this class is very similar to that. Your issues that you will have in this class, they aren't really in this class. If for some reason you're finding things difficult, it means that you're not remembering your calculus, you're not remembering your algebra, right? That's where the, the pitfalls are going to be. And so earlier I was talking about these uh, mistakes where a lot of people, might think, well, why are you telling us this? This is not algebra class. Well, I am telling you as from experience that these are the kinds of mistakes that students mess up with. Very simple algebra mistakes, very simple derivative mistakes, very simple integral mistakes, um, things that shouldn't really happen. So um, yeah, another thing, I am gonna be talking about linear algebra a little bit. So I posted a link here if you want to brush up on some linear algebra. You don't have to go very in depth, but I posted a link uh, to some things that you might want to brush up on. Um, I don't know, relatively soon, maybe by the end of next week, uh, try to get through some linear algebra. 
So review everything you know from Calc 1, Calc 2 in terms of computing derivatives and integrals solving equations, um, as well as look over some linear algebra, know how to do matrix addition, matrix multiplication, know how to find uh, determinants, know how to solve systems of equations with matrices, uh, and so on and so forth. That's going to be important conceptually moving forward. And you can use uh, this to the, this link here to wrap up. So that's it. That's the first class. I know it's been kind of an information dump. I've been just talking almost nonstop since the beginning of class. But today was just the intro, me giving you information about the class, how it's going to be run, and me actually kind of introducing to you what the class is about, where we're going to go. Um, so yeah, that's kind of all I have for you guys today. Um, before we finish, remember to finish that questionnaire. Remember to reach out to me if you didn't see an email from me uh, from Jupyter Grades. Remember to check that you can log into the homework system and send me an email if you cannot. Otherwise, are there any questions before we go? So I will post a video, the video on YouTube. And there is a link to the playlist on in the syllabus. And on the on the class webpage, sorry. So if you go to the class webpage, which I showed you guys earlier, you will see a link to the video playlist. And normally it, it's it's it takes a while for the video to process. So normally, um, you won't see a video pop up until the night of the day of the class. So you probably won't see this video uh, until late tonight at some point. Um, so, but I will post a video and a PDF of these notes that you see me writing right now. So there are some notes that I type because it's, it's I don't like writing on a tablet like I'm doing right now. So sometimes I write slow or my handwriting isn't the best. So sometimes I'll type out some notes and it might be too, you might not uh, be able to copy all of these notes. So I also post, I'll also post a PDF version of the notes that I'm having here. That should help you out. That will be posted with the video. So when I post the video in the video description, you will see a link to the PDF for these notes. And that usually will be posted at, in, nighttime at some point. Okay, so again, what you guys need to do, uh, check that you are getting communication from me, check that you can uh, get into the homework, finish the questionnaire, and look out for that post. Also, if you realize that you're a little rusty on calculus or algebra, start brushing up on that now. Uh, this includes linear algebra just some basics with matrices. Uh, so I will start actually brushing up on that now. Okay, that being said, I am going to uh, let you guys go. Okay, so hopefully you guys had fun. If you have any questions, uh, uh, email me and I will see you guys tomorrow. All right, yes, bye, you're welcome, you're welcome. All right, bye everybody.